Good morning and welcome to worship this beautiful Sunday morning. A couple of announcements for you today. Um, reminder that the office, church office, is closed tomorrow for Independence Day. And next Sunday, we'd love to have you all here um, to join us for the passport report from our youth. Our youth are taking over the service next Sunday and showing you what they experienced at camp last week. So it's going to be a blessing of a service. So we encourage all of you to come and be a part of that. We also want to welcome our guest online this morning um, and welcome all of you here today because it's going to be a wonderful Sunday um, and just breathe it in, take it in, and it is the God's day. Also, don't forget your tithes and offerings. There are several ways you can give online and in the offering plates up at the front. So now if that's it, if we can all join them together in prayer. Creator God, thank you so much for bringing everyone here today. We ask that you bless us. We ask that you open our hearts to your word today. We ask that you help us to live it each and every day. Lord, guide us, lead us, and direct us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 11 through 22. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace, and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among, among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, if you walk before me faithfully as David your father did and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a successor to rule over Israel. But if you turn away and forsake the decrees and commands I have given you, and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot Israel from my land, which I have given them, and I will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. I will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. This temple will become a heap of rubble. All who pass by will be appalled and say, Why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? People will answer because they have forsaken the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who brought them out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. That is why he brought all this disaster on them. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you please join me in prayer? Father, as we gather to worship this morning, uh, we do so understanding that what we sow in our life, we often reap. God, when we seek you, we are told in the scriptures that we will find you. And as Christian brothers and sisters who are saved by your grace, we are called to live our lives under the, 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 lead, the leadership and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. And in doing so, we are called to experience your kingdom around us all the time. Whereas we just read from Second Chronicles about Solomon... Um, and the, the word that you gave to him, it still rings true today. We are called to seek you. We are called to pray. We are called to, to not seek the things of this world, but to seek your kingdom. And in doing so, God, you bless that. But God, if we choose to seek the things of this world and, sing, and, and to live our lives out of harmony with you, that's what we will experience. God, we thank you for our country. And on this day, uh, we do celebrate our independence we, th we give thanks for, uh, for being citizens uh, of a nation that experiences religious freedom. We give thanks for those people who have given their lives over the centuries to protect that freedom. God, we, uh, we, we recognize that we are a blessed people, but with blessing, with freedom, comes great responsibility. And Lord, sometimes it can be easy to watch news and see politics and wish things were different. And, and we're called to be part of the political system and casting votes, but we're also called to make wise decisions with the millions, with the millions of decisions that come between voting days. So Lord, help us to examine our hearts today, to examine our lives and, and to ask ourselves the question, are we living in harmony with your kingdom or not? Uh, Lord, we thank you that we are given uh, eternal life through Jesus Christ. And we also recognize and give thanks that uh, that eternal life can be experienced here and now. In, in the many ups and downs that life brings to us. So, God, we, uh, we pray that you would show us how to be your people. How First Baptist Church of Farmville uh, can, can, can live into the calling that we have to be the body of of Christ. God, we pray for our, the members of our church who are going through various things right now and those who are on our prayer list. Uh, we ask for healing. We ask for you to move um, in their lives. Uh, we pray that you would show us how we can be your presence 
in their lives. And God, give us, um, give us the, the frame of mind to lift them up in prayer often. And another person, in addition to our prayer list that we want to remember this morning, is Holly's cousin, Jamie, um, who is just uh, is going through cancer treatments for ovarian cancer. We want to lift her up to you and hold her in our hearts as well. We give you all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. And now I ask you to stand with me and to uh, sing uh, hymn number 446. We have a story to tell to the nations. telling me good morning. So are y'all excited? Why? Why are you excited? You don't know? We're just excited? Why are you excited? Oh, you're going putt putting today? Very nice. Why are you? You're going to shoot off fireworks today? Very nice. Fireworks. Why are we seeing fireworks? It is. Well, today is the third, but we're celebrating the 4th of July, which is tomorrow. Why do we celebrate? Very good. It is. It's for our freedom. We have a lot of freedoms in the U.S. We can travel almost anywhere we want to go. We can live anywhere we want to live. We can work anywhere we're able to work. 
So we can do and choose. We can go to church wherever we want. Do you know there are places in the world that they can't go to church? They can believe, but they can't go to church. So we're very blessed that we get to celebrate our freedoms today and tomorrow and over the course of the next few days. Why do we have freedom for church? Who do we celebrate today and every day? God and Jesus. Jesus dying on the cross gave us eternal life with God, and that's the ultimate freedom that we have because we can love God in our hearts. And we can't ask for anything better than that. We've already been so blessed in each and every day. And we're blessed to live in a land that, in a country that we can pretty much say and do what we want to do. And for y'all, you have to listen to mom and dad. But eventually, you'll get to be old enough where you can do and say what you want to do. But we're very blessed. And we're blessed because we do have Christ in our life. So we want to remember as we celebrate. Yes, we're celebrating our freedom in the United States as freedom um, as a free country. But we also have freedom with Christ, and that's the true blessing and celebration, okay? So let's remember and let's pray. Creator God, thank you so much for your son. Thank you for giving us freedom through him and for loving us and blessing us with all that we have. Help us to remember that, honor that, and be thankful for that. Lord, it's in your name we pray. Amen. I'm always thankful for uh, the little moment there. They helped me reset from, you know, up here being in father mode a little bit. So, seeing Luke. We all pray for us. I know some of y'all saw my Facebook post yesterday. We're going to cause a little bit of trouble on, on East Horn Avenue this evening. And uh, we, we did a couple of smoke bombs yesterday. And Luke tried to pick them up while they're still smoking and throw them in another location. So, anyway. But thank y'all, choir. Thank you. It's beautiful. Good, it's good to be here. Um, I had a fun week with our youth this past week, and I'm just so looking forward to them sharing and leading us in worship uh, next Sunday. Um, it's going to be a very special time of worship, so I hope you're able to come, maybe bring a friend uh, with you and um, everything. So today we are in week number three of a four-week series that is called An Eternal Perspective, and I've enjoyed, 
I've enjoyed preaching the first two parts of this and um, hope that this continues to be a meaningful series. Um, yeah, I, I shared at the beginning that I've been having several conversations and pastoral care visits with people and, and, and just reminding folks that we have to have an eternal perspective of things. And I, love, I love being alive. I love, I love living. I, 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 you know, I pray for every person that we're able to experience long lives, but when we compare the length of life that we experience here to eternity, it pales in comparison. Throughout this series, I've been using some, some various things to illustrate how long eternity is. And I'm not going to string this out today, but uh, this is a 50-foot rope. And I sectioned off just one inch of it. And so if that was to represent uh, you know, a long lifespan of a human being, being about a, a century, a hundred years, then if we extrapolated it a, a, over 50 feet, we would have 60,000 years or 30 times uh, just trying to put into perspective, sometimes we think about how long ago it was that Jesus was born uh, to now, about 30 times that length of time. It's a long time. And I, I said, if you could imagine just wrapping this thing around the world, and we could probably do the math on that. If anyone's a, a math wizard and wants to take that on later this afternoon, text me and I'll include you in the, in the, the last installment of this sermon series, which won't be next week because the youth are going to handle uh, the sermon and we're going to have a message from Zach uh, cash next Sunday, uh, but the week after that, we'll, we'll share that math. Um, but just imagine, imagine that. Uh, another illustration that I used is uh, one that one of, my, um, one of the youth leaders in the church I grew up in would often reference to help us think about how long eternity is. And he would say, imagine if the earth was a diamond, the, one of the hardest substances known to man. And, and Graham had a pigeon whose feathers would never wear out. And that pigeon just flew constantly around the world. And every time it flew, it, 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 it stroked against that diamond. Imagine how long it would take to wear that diamond down. And, and last week, we used uh, Gina's diamond, and a couple of the youth took turns doing that during the sermon. And it didn't wear it down at all. Imagine how long, though, it would take to wear that whole thing down. And that's just the beginning. There's an infinite number of, of Earth's giant diamonds lined up. We've been looking in this series at... The book of Romans, is, there's a specific chapter, chapter 8, uh, where Paul, 24 years into his ministry, um, he, he writes this book uh, while on his third missionary journey in Corinth. He writes it to the church in Rome, and he's, he's imploring them to be mature in their faith and to see the struggles and things they go through in this world, that they're, that they're not going to last forever. They're momentary. In, in the first part of chapter 8, he talks to them about living life by the Spirit, and then he jumps into, as we live life by the Spirit, let's, let's, let's go through the present sufferings, understanding that there will be future glory, that there is a future hope that is in Jesus Christ. So I want to do a little bit of a recap over the first two of these sermons, and, and um, I'm going to read through, uh, we've basically been looking at this passage, Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 30, and we're kind of just building each week. So we're going to go back and we're going to read the first part. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a reminder, so if you weren't here, um, you can, can get on the same page. Or if you're like me, and just sometimes week to week, you're like, what happened last Sunday? We'll all be on the same page. Does that sound good? Yeah, okay. I saw a lot of head nods there. I like that, okay? All right, so this is what Paul says. He says in verse 18 of chapter 8 in Romans, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For, we, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. In that, uh, that first sermon, there were a couple of points that I tried to get across. And the first is that our present sufferings pale in comparison to the hope of eternity. Our present sufferings, and we go through hard things. We go through really hard things. Tragedy strikes. The diagnosis, a hard one may come our way to a family member or to ourselves. We're not promised that we're, the Christian life or life in general is going to be without hardships. Most of the time when we're young, we don't experience them firsthand. Some people do, 
But as we grow older, they hit us closer. And we need to remember that Paul says that he considers that what we're going through, these present suffering, they are not even worth. They're, it's, it's not like measuring apples to apples, oranges to oranges. It's, it's, it's like a grain of sand versus all the fruit in the world. It's, it's, it's take two things that are on the, 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 the most extreme and try to compare them. And he says they, they, they don't even, they're not in the same ballpark. I read from Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 through 8 that talks about the new creation, the new heaven and the new earth that we will experience one day that where brokenness, sadness, darkness, despair, depression, none of those things, cancer does not exist. It's going to be perfect. Perfect harmony, perfect unity. Not nation against nation, but all unified under the lordship and love of Jesus Christ. Do you long for that? Amen? Or oh me, or I don't know. <laughs> or maybe we think that's too far-fetched to, to believe, but that's what we're told in the scriptures. Go read Revelation chapter 21, 1 through 8. We see that Eden is restored. The Garden of Eden, the relationship between Adam and Eve and the Lord is restored. In, in, in the beginning of the Bible, we're shown that there is a garden there are a couple of people and there is God. We're shown in the end that there is a world made up of gardens with billions of people and one God. Perfect harmony. Paul says to keep this thing at the forefront of our mind, to have an eternal perspective rooted in that truth. Another thing we talked about, and you see that Paul starts talking about the creation, that the creation groans. We talked about uh, the fact that all people in all creation experience brokenness. Anybody know a farmer right now that needs some rain? Yeah. Anybody got some grass that needs some rain right now? I was walking to feed the pigeons this morning and I'm like looking down. There's something going on in my backyard. It, there's like some streaks of, and there's ants crawling on these. So if anybody's a grass expert, I need some advice at the end. But there's brokenness everywhere. I had a job for eight summers in a row scouting cotton, soybeans, and peanuts. And if, if, if we lived in heaven right now, and this is the new heaven and the new earth, I wouldn't have had a job because all those crops wouldn't need any help. They wouldn't need somebody to walk through them and to inspect them for disease and for pests and for weeds. But we live in brokenness. Go read Genesis chapter 3 where uh, Adam and Eve sin against God and there's punishment for that. We see that brokenness ex it comes into the reality of creation and the whole thing since the very beginning has been groaning. So then uh, last week, I uh, went into the, the next few verses. And so I'll read those now, uh, verses 22 through 25, where Paul says that we, he continues in this personification of creation. He says, we know that the whole creation, creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. You know, it's, it's like if you've ever been there in, in labor and delivery before, um, I wasn't, you know, I'm experienced, I'm not going to tell no gory details, I promise, Gina. But I remember, like, there's, like, a little seismic chart. Y'all ever seen the seismic chart? It's, I don't know, it's probably not called that, but, you know, you know what a seismic thing is, like, when stuff is going. So they put on, on, the, on the stomach um, one of those, am I saying that right? Stomach? Yeah, okay. Um, you know, the baby's in there, and the muscles are contracting. Jeffrey and Nigel and Daniel are, yeah, we'll talk about this later. We'll debrief if I did, if I did okay, and then our wives will tell us. Anyway, um, so, and there's a little chart thing, and it's like, chick, 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 and it gets real high, real high, real high. It's like a, you know, like a lie detector type thing, except for, for the stomach. And, uh, and when, the, when the muscles are contracting, and there's some pain there, right, ladies? Anybody's ever had a baby? When the, when the, when the things get, it's, mm, so we experience that in the world, right? There are times when it's going off the charts, and the pain in the world is so great. You don't have pain. You, you don't have a birth if you don't have pain. So they knew that well back in that day. I told you last week that, you know, we have hospital rooms where, you know, we see on Facebook, we see the shiny little baby. It's been all cleaned up and everything. And we didn't hear anything about the birth and how all that went down. But back in the day, it happened in the hut and everybody knew what was going on. It was part of the culture. They knew what childbirth was. And so Paul tells them that that's what's going on now. That's what this broken, everything, everything is, while life is beautiful, life is wonderful, it should be enjoyed. We should find joy in the things that we do in partnership with the Lord. 
the whole thing is not going to be like this forever. And there should be hope, especially for those people who suffer the most. That should bring eternal hope. And so I talked about last week, you know, everything, everything groans. Everything is groaning. Then we got to verse 23 where he says, Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption, the sonship, the redemption of our bodies. If we are in Jesus, we are the first fruits of the new creation. No, we're not as we're going to be for eternity when we, we, we don't battle anymore with the flesh and with the Spirit. We're always battled. Paul says that in Galatians. There's this battle that we experience between the flesh and between the Spirit. And don't let it, if you're, if you're a person who has faith in Jesus and there are things that you continue to battle in your life, don't let the devil tell you that that means you're not a Christian, that you're not born again, that you're not saved. We're told that we're going to battle those things until our dying breath, but then we, when we awake anew, when we transition into the presence of Jesus for eternity, those things will not exist anymore. It will be fully us in perfection with Christ, and we should long for that. But we are, we are called to begin experiencing those first fruits now. In Galatians, he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. That we're to live in relationship with Jesus. And if we're doing that, then those things will just ooze out of us. So we are the first fruits. And we're told that there's only hope in Jesus Christ. He says in verse 24 through 25, In this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Because of Jesus, we have a hope that we can patiently wait on. So today we're going to go a little deeper. We're only going to go two verses further. Um, and, and I want to talk a little bit. This, this sermon this morning is called An Eternal Perspective, The Mind of the Spirit. An Eternal Perspective, Mind of the Spirit. And it comes from verse 26 uh, where Paul continues. He says, in the same way... The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with wordless groans. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Now when it comes to teaching about the Holy Spirit, we could talk for hours and hours and days upon days and trying to explain and understand the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is, is so active and moving in and, 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 and each of us. While it is the same Holy Spirit of God, he's, he, he, he's illuminating things for us in a different way and leading us on different paths, yet it all works together uh, within God's will. So I just want to say a few things this morning. If you are taking notes, um, I've been doing that throughout the series, um, hopefully they'll be easy to follow along. The first thing that I want to say about the mind of the Spirit is that the mind of the Spirit is empathetic to a hurting world. The mind of the Spirit, if we have the mind of the Spirit, we become empathetic to a hurting world. We understand that other people are going through things and we can actually spend time with them to, to, to understand what it feels like and, and, and what their experience is. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there's nothing, there is nothing more lonely than feeling like you are battling something by yourself. In fact, that's the way the, the devil likes to to, to, to work on us, to separate us from God, is to make us feel like we're carrying it all by ourselves. But we are called to live in relationship with one another. You'll notice within our youth group and the things that they, I'm sure, will share next week, that when they spend that time together on a trip like we experienced at Passport, they spend more and more time with each other. Eventually they start realizing they're all kind of going through the same things. And they start opening up, they start feeling comfortable, and they start allowing one another to, to carry each other's burdens and to talk through and work through and process things. They become empathetic to one another. They experience empathy. The second thing I would say that the mind of the Spirit does is that the mind of the Spirit is always working within God's will. Verse 27 says, He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. 
You know, sometimes when we talk about the will of God, uh, we can get a little bit lost, can't we? We don't understand how all things are working together for the will of, uh, of, of God and for the will of the Lord. And in fact, our very next verse is going to be one of those coffee mug verses. We're going to talk about that in two weeks in verse 28. It's not on the screen, but I'm going to go ahead and read it. We know that in all things, God works together for the good of those who love him and who've been called according to his purpose. We know those things, don't we? We, we, we know this verse, right? We believe this verse, yet we don't know how it's all going to work together. But let me give you some encouragement this morning. If you're going through a hard thing and you're asking, well, in the end, what, what does this mean? Let me just give you some encouragement that if you're going through it with Jesus, even though you might not know what the very next step is, I promise you that if you choose the will of God, if you choose the way of God, that he will reveal that to you in the end. And it's all part of him working things together for our good. The last thing I want to say about the mind of the Spirit this morning is that the mind of the Spirit is ready to say yes to the call of God. And I want us to jump a little bit further into the Bible to, to, to read another passage. And there's also going to be another illustration here about life and about eternity. I love the book of James. You've heard me talk about it before. That I, I think you know, that Jesus really had to do something big to convince his half-brother that he was God. And so we have the book of James, the half-brother of Jesus, coming near the end of the New Testament. And, uh, and, and everything is so practical there. He just teaches us about how to live life, live the Christian life, live under the, the, you know, the servanthood and the guiding and leading of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And James says in chapter 4, verse 13 through 17, he says, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. It's talking about us, right? Who knows what they're going to do this afternoon? Got plans tonight? Where are you going to try to see the fireworks from? We want the rain, but just before and after the fireworks, right? Not during the fireworks. Do you know what you're going to do tomorrow? Do you know what you're going to do next Friday? Does anyone have a vacation plan in a couple weeks or a month from now? Or maybe you're on vacation right now, the one that you've planned. Yeah, we make, we, we make some plans, right? We say, we're going to do this thing, we're going to do that thing. We organize our schedules. And so he's saying, now listen, y'all who say that you're going to do that kind of thing. I'm going to take this kind of job. I'm going to have this career. Verse 14, why do you, why do you, do you not, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't make plans. Plans are good, okay? Um, but he says here, he, he asks the question, why, why, why sometimes are we so... Are we so controlled by the plans that we make that we miss what, what we're supposed to do being the little vapor of the mist? Y'all see that? I hope I don't get the Christ candle knocked down. All right. That, that's a mist or a vapor, right? Y'all don't really get to see me from the front. So I'll, there you go. All right. Now, now, we, now, we, now, I'm sure they didn't have spray bottles back in this time, Okay. So probably more than likely what they're talking about is maybe the mist or the vapor or the fog that you might see on a beautiful morning. Think about, it, think about a late summer morning when we, you know, we tend to get those rains sometimes late. Temperatures begin getting a little cooler in the morning, and I'm not a meteorologist, but I know there's some dew point thing going on, and so we wake up in the morning and there's a fog. And we might feel like, oh, we got to go to work in the fog, maybe we have a little bit of a drive. But do you know that when the fog finally starts burning off a little bit, and it's kind of going away, and then it, what emerges is a beautiful blue sky, beautiful white clouds, the sun is up, you can see the green trees. You know that feeling? I want to try to get you there this morning, okay? I want us to, to see that, yes, yeah, so our lives might be a mist, and maybe, maybe it's more like a fog on the morning, but it's brief, isn't it? And what comes after it is, is beautiful. I think there's a beautiful illustration there, But I think what God has called us to do is in, in the vapor, in the mist, in the fog, is to live it beautifully. I talked to Daniel a little bit about this a couple of weeks, was it last week? But then I kind of decided I wanted to make sure I kept my job. So, well, you know, think, think about, think about maybe, you know, maybe that seems boring to you, but I think, you know, with Jesus, and this is another cool, and cool illustration, but you got to use your thinking caps today. Let's say we had our lighter or our, our lamppost, remember the lamppost? And our vapor, instead of doing water, was hairspray, Okay. <laughs> 
Okay? But still, it's brief, right? If we were to have a lighter, put some hairspray on it, just a little spurt, you know, vapor, mist, it's going to be beautiful. My hope is that, my hope is that, that we can all experience living Jesus within the short scope of that vapor in a beautiful way that we put off the light of Jesus Christ. But sometimes the plans we make and our inability to be flexible about those plans can put us outside of discerning and knowing how to live within the will of God. We have a lot of, you know, think about the the story of the Good Samaritan and those religious leaders who were walking by to saw the, the, the man and they just they, they were too busy with their religious things that they were doing. And it was the person who was seeing the Samaritan who was outside of the Jewish world, the person that they didn't even want to, he said, just the, the man who stopped, the man who showed compassion. It was the person that, that, that who Jesus was talking to. He, he didn't even want to acknowledge him. He was the one who stopped and had compassion on the man. He was the good Samaritan. My hope is that we could all live sensitive to the Spirit of God's leading in our lives, ready to say yes to the call of God. And James, I think, is getting on some of those things, touching on some of those things here. He says, well, again, why you don't even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord, Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Let me ask you this morning, in your life, are you so committed to the things that you have to do that you miss being the presence of Christ in somebody's life? This past week, at camp, I want to show, share one of my stories, and then next week we're just going to have the you share their stories. I want to share a story with you of how I saw God at work in me, and it kind of pertains to this. In, in my, the, little, the limited free time we had, I was trying to do some study on the sermon, and and um, one afternoon, I was, uh, so the way the schedules worked, and, and we, we had all these things going on. Again, they're going to share more of that, but we had all these things going on from the time you wake up, Bible studies in the morning, um, you have, get sent out for lunch, you do some either missions, missions uh, uh, education program, their little thing, a simulation, it was really cool that they went through, um, a worship leading, you planned the worship that night, then you had a little bit of free time, then you had dinner, and then between dinner um, and what came from worship after that, you had a little bit of free time. So I showered up one evening and went down uh, to a green space and sat and, and just had a little bit of time of reading my Bible and, and praying and, and, and journaling. And um, one of the questions I was asking God, and I would try to carve out some time. Sometimes I would just do it in my room or, or else go out like that. That's when I just started thinking about what are the things I want to ask the youth in the group devotions that would follow worship in the evening. And so, uh, you know, I'm thinking about the youth, you know, things I've seen during the day. I'm praying for them and, um, you know, having a little moment with Jesus. And then I go back to over to the auditorium. And I'm waiting for everybody to roll up and um, I, I get my phone out and I want to see what's going on. Because I was posting some pictures on Facebook for y'all to see. Anybody see my post this week? Y'all are like, what's happened to Graham? He's all of a sudden super social because uh, I don't post a ton on Facebook. So um, anyway, I, I was looking through and next thing I know, a guy taps me on the shoulder. And so I've been, I've been sitting there asking God, God, you know, show me how I can lead these youth later tonight. I'm making plans to lead later, right? You get that? Making plans, how, what's going to go on later. And a person taps me on the shoulder, and I look up, and this, it's a young man, probably, probably a little younger than me, uh, has some bags in his hands, and he says, hey, man, I need a Bible. And I said, um, I was kind of taken off guard. And I, said, I said, you do? He said, yeah. He said, I'm homeless, um, and I need a Bible. And I was thinking, okay, well, Let's find him a Bible. So I said, well, they're about to open, open the doors here. And, you know, I'm thinking on my feet. I wasn't ready. You know, I hadn't prepared like I was prepared for later. I'm thinking on my feet. And, and so I was like, yeah, they're going to open the doors here in a little bit. And we'll go in. I'm sure somebody probably has a Bible somewhere. But then I, I started asking the Spirit. I started feeling something and hear some compassion moving. Remember Jesus, every time Jesus had compassion, the Bible says every time Jesus had compassion, he had action that matched his compassion. The Greek word for compassion is splachnizomai, and it means literally for the bowels to yearn. A groan. You feel it deep in here. I started feeling that, and, I'm, and then so I'm just, I'm starting to get into the mode. I shared this with Gina. God, I, what do you want me to do here? 
So I look, the doors are not opening. It's going to probably be 10 minutes before the door opens. So I turn back to him, and, um, and I feel like God's like, give him your Bible. But I'm like thinking, God, I need my Bible. for. I only got one Bible with me. I need it for later. And then God's like, you got a phone that you can get the Bible on. Give him your Bible. And I said, I'm thinking in my mind, I'm, I'm having this internal dialogue going. I said, well, and I probably shouldn't have said this. I said, well, can you give me a sign? Just kind of said that. I need a sign here. And so I, I said, say, I say, hey, man, my name is Graham. And he says, my name's Luke. And immediately, y'all, I just felt the tears welling up in my eyes. And without missing a beat, I said, hey, I'm going to give you my Bible. And, um, I said, and so I gave it to him. I said, I'm going to sit down. I want you to talk to me. Just, I want you to share with me a little bit. And I want to pray with you. And so um, he tells me that he's, uh, he's moved to Greensboro from Myrtle Beach because he's been in and out of addiction, uh, the drugs and alcohol. He says, Myrtle Beach this time of year is a terrible place to be because the activity is so high. So I came to Greensboro. There's some people I know here, and I'm staying with them some, and I'm also living uh, in the park. He said, since it's so warm, I can do that this time of year. He said, I have my bags here. I got some food. He said, but I don't have a Bible. He said, in my, in my programs, I've been, I've been in a lot of Bible-based programs, and it's been the only place I've been able to find healing and hope. He said, and in my transition from here to there, I lost my stuff, I lost my Bible and my resources. And so we just shared sitting on the bench with each other for a little bit, and then I prayed with him, and then he left. But it just reminded me that I need to not be so tied to, to what I need to do, like what's coming up. Be, I mean, I need to make plans. That's good. But I need to be able to be interrupted. Amen? There's a lot of groaning going on around us, a lot of groaning in our world. There's a big need for interruption there's a big need for us to go and stand in those places. I try to do that with our youth and with our chaperones. You know, um, we got Kimley over here. We had Eden and Beth were two of our uh, other chaperones. And, um, you know, with my ministry to all of them this week, you know, I, I haven't, I've been growing in my relationship with the youth and they're kind of nervous around me and I'm kind of nervous around them. And, and, uh, and so I just kind of, just kind of over and over, just kind of try to step out of that comfort zone and just, Ask them questions about their lives and things going on. And time after time after time after time, when I did that, the Lord worked within that interaction. The Lord ministered to me. I was able to minister to them. They, the students and chaperones ministered to me. It was a beautiful, beautiful thing. And recapping this morning, the, as we have an eternal perspective, we're to have the mind of the Holy Spirit. We're to have empathy for this hurting world that's groaning. We're to trust that if we're following Jesus, we're working within his will. We might not know what it's going to look like in the end, but we are working within his will. You might be suffering right now, and you might have family members watching you go through something really hard. But I promise you that if you do so with Jesus, that you, that you are part of God showing people coming behind you that they can go through anything in life. And the mind of the Spirit, the mind of the Spirit needs to be flexible and ready to say yes to whatever God calls us to. So this morning I want to give an invitation to you. If, uh, if you feel called to respond in any way, um, I will be here at the front to receive you. Maybe this morning you want to become a member of the church. Uh, perhaps uh, the Lord has been working in your life and um, you haven't made a, a public profession of faith in Jesus Christ. And you want to do that this morning or or maybe you've done that and haven't been baptized and you uh, desire to be baptized. In whatever way you come, I will be here at the front to receive you in the name of Jesus. And um, I invite you now to stand and to sing with us hymn number 575, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms.
he is, co- has, uh, has, is coming from the Memorial Baptist Church in Greenville, North Carolina. And she lives here in, uh, in Farmville. And we saw each other. It's been several months ago. I was going into the tractor supply and uh, in, over in, is it, is it considered uh, Winterville? Winter, over in Winterville and, and, and saw her and she said, I live right beside Linda Blankenship and I'm going to be coming to First Baptist. And, uh, and sure enough, I think within the week or two, um, you, you had come and uh, you've assimilated right into this family of faith here and you've been singing in the choir as well. And so we have been overjoyed by your presence. And uh, over the past uh, month or so, you've uh, felt the calling to become an official member of the church, and so we welcome you today. Um, you've heard it. You've probably heard us do it before. We do a uh, when we welcome a member, we do covenants. We make promises to one another, and so um, I'm going to lead Rebecca uh, through that, and um, you all are going to be part of that as well. So be on your toes and be ready. All right, Rebecca, this is to you. As a member of this family of faith, will you support the mission and ministry of First Baptist Church with your presence, prayers, and service? As the Holy Spirit grants you gifts to follow Jesus as his disciple, if so, please indicate by saying, I will. And to uh, the members of First Baptist Church, will you, members of First Baptist, pledge your support to Rebecca by offering your presence, prayers, and service to her as the Holy Spirit leads you? Will you promise to surround her with a community of love and grace that she may grow as a disciple of Christ and be found faithful in her service to others? And will you model authentic discipleship and offer Rebecca guidance and nurture while receiving guidance and nurture from her? If so, please indicate by saying, we will. will. It's official. We are all family. We we were family before, but now we're even deeper family. And um, and I just want to say welcome to you. I love you too. Um, I want to ask Rebecca to stand here uh, following the service, if that's all right with you. And everyone come by and say hello. Does Does that sound good? And, um, and uh, again, we welcome, welcome you to this family. Welcome, I think this is your daughter visiting us this morning. We're glad, that, we're glad, Sarah, that you are here present with us as well. So at uh, this time, I invite you to stand for our benediction. All right, let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for Rebecca. We thank you for the decision she's made to uh, become a member of our church. And we pray that, uh, that, she, that she and our church will continue uh, to thrive as we uh, seek you together, go on journey with you together, and support one another in, in our faith experiences and journeys with Jesus. Uh, Lord, we pray that as we leave today that we would be uh, more discerning uh, maybe than we were before of your Holy Spirit and your leadership and guidance in our lives. Help us to understand that you are um, in the presence of working all things together for our good and the world's good, and, and that you've chosen to do that through Jesus Christ, your Son. It's in his name we pray. Amen, and may you go in peace. Amen.